computers have spoiled us. We press a key. We want some information right away. And if the computer or the iPad is slow, five seconds, ten seconds, we get impatient, forgetting that 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted that information, you'd have to go someplace else, find a book, learn to look into the book, find the page where the information was, and not be all that certain you were going to find it in that book. And then try another one, then another one. So we could develop an unrealistic idea about, about the practice as well. We want things to be instant, automatic, right away. We've lost the ability to be patient and to understand what patience means. It doesn't mean just sitting around waiting and tapping your foot, because there's work to be done, but it's long-term work. So patience means the ability to stick with something over the long term. And when things come up that are difficult, you have to learn how not to let the difficulty weigh you down. You're not just sitting there putting up with the pain. You've got to figure out if there's pain here is an area where there's no pain. It's an area that gives me the strength that I can work on to develop resistance to that pain. You change your focus. And sometimes you find that the whole problem was your focus to begin with. Years back when I was just getting started in the meditation, there was a period when I was away from a John Fuang for several months. And as I was meditating, I'd find it was getting harder and harder to breathe. It was like my body was just getting more and more solid all the time. And the effort that went into trying to breathe just seemed more and more futile. I finally had a chance to go see him and told him the problem. He said, oh, you're focusing on the earth element. Focus on space. And as he said it, as I focused on space, that sense of oppression immediately lifted. So in that case, the problem was something I was doing. And also the problem was my inability to think outside the box, to look at look for areas where there was some strength that I could fall back on. So here we are on a long-term project, cleaning out the mind. And it's like cleaning out an enormous house that's been vandalized and it's been well, had all kind of animals moving in. Nobody proper has lived there for a long time. Nobody's been cleaning it up. There's just all kinds of junk, all kinds of garbage. And a few animals still living in there. And we've got to clear it out. So you work on it room by room, task by task, bit by bit. And if you start thinking about how big the job is, it can overwhelm you. So you don't think about that. You think about, this is the problem I've got right now. Let's focus right here. Try to break it down into manageable bits. And you find that you can endure a lot more than you could have otherwise, and you have more stick to activities than you would have had otherwise. And this means the ability also to be equanimous about things that you can't do anything about, and also equanimous about things you could do something about, but it's actually going to get in the way of your larger goals. This is a part of equanimity that's often overlooked, because sometimes there are things you can change. But if you make that change, you win that battle, it sets you up to lose another battle. And we see this easily in, in life here in the community. You may win a battle over some issue, but it offends other people. And they're going to be less likely to cooperate on a later, later battle. So you've got to choose, choose your battles and realize there are some things that you could win if you wanted to, but they'd be bad for you in the long run, those victories. Keep remembering the Buddha's statement that victory over yourself is better than victory over thousands of people.
Now, what are the victories over yourself? Well, one is this tendency you have to keep on creating unnecessary suffering for yourself. For the Buddha, that was the big battle. That's the one worth winning. And you're not going to be the only one who benefits from that, because people who create a lot of suffering for themselves tend to lean a lot on other people. They're constantly coming and saying, help, help me with this, help me with that, I've got this problem. And so the unnecessary suffering you place on yourself is kind of like a domino effect. It begins to affect other people as well. The less you make yourself suffer, the less you need to lean on other people, and actually the more helpful you can be to them. So take this as your main battle. Take this as the main focus. And that's for the little battles you might win along the way. If they're in line with this, okay. You can fight those battles. But if they're not in line with this, they're better not they're better not won. So patience and equanimity, of course, require discernment to figure out what has to be put up with, what doesn't have to be put up with. As the Buddha says, there are certain things that you should endure and other things you shouldn't endure at all. You should learn how to endure hurtful words from other people, painful feelings. And you learn to endure those by thinking in the right way with the painful feelings, while you know how to use a breath to work with pain, you know how to use your understanding of pain to help so that the pain doesn't overcome you. And the same thing applies with hurtful words. Learn to depersonalize them so they're not like arrows aimed at your heart. Someone else may be aiming them at your heart, but if you open up your chest and say, here, right here, right here, stab me right here, of course they're going to hit you. But if you refuse to take the words in, in other words, you hear them, but you let them just stop right there at the ear, as the Buddha says, and tell yourself an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear, and just leave it there, without all the extra narratives we tend to put on it. Particularly the narrative that says, if I don't respond with some sharp comment, they're going to think that I'm a doormat. No, you just let it stop. We tend to forget that patience and endurance are strengths. They're not weaknesses. They may look like weakness outside when we're not snapping back at somebody, but then the snapping back becomes your, becomes your karma. You've won that battle, maybe, but you've lost a bigger battle. So those are the kinds of things you should endure, things you shouldn't endure, when thoughts of ill will, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of harmfulness arise in the mind. You don't let them stay. You don't let them take over. I mean, it's natural that they will come, but you don't have to continue with them. In a John Lee's image, you don't have to continue weaving that thought, let, it, let its frag, frayed ends dangle in the wind. But just leave it, leave it, leave it. Don't let it take hold in the mind. So you need the kind of discernment to figure out what needs to be endured, what doesn't need to be endured, what needs to be changed, what can't be changed, what could be changed, but it's better off not getting involved. That kind of discernment takes time. One of the reasons why the practice takes time. After all, the deathless is always there, but our ability to to detect it requires that our discernment gets sharper and sharper, and discernment doesn't grow in leaps and bounds. It gets sharpened each time you use it, a bit, bit by bit by bit. And with that gradual process, it finally breaks through. You know, the Buddha's image is of the continental shelf of India. There's a gradual slope and then a sudden drop. The gradual slope is the refinement of your discernment. As you get more and more clear about what you're doing and the results of what you're doing in your practice of virtue or concentration, then when things to come together, then there's a sharp drop. 
it's, it's a quantum leap, something very different from anything that went before. But for that balance to come together and for that sharpness of discernment to be there requires long-term practice. So understand patience and endurance and equanimity as strengths. And understand that there's a skill in each case. When things are tough, where do you find the parts of your mind? Where do you find the way of thinking that can make it not so tough, that can give you some support so you're not in totally one-on-one -on -one with nothing but pain, one-on-one -on -one with nothing but disappointment, whatever. Every time there's a problem, ask yourself, okay, where's the, where's the countervailing force inside the mind? Where's the home where you can retreat to, a sense of a center that's yours? Sometimes it may not be in the body. If you can't find any place in the body, well, think of the area immediately around the body. Space can't be squeezed. Space can't be turned into pain. And then from there, move back into the body with a new attitude, with a new understanding. So bring some discernment to your equanimity. Bring some of your discernment to the choice of battles you're going to take. Bring some discernment to your patience. That'll, make, that'll enable you to stick with the path and gradually see results. And see those gradually appearing results not as a sign of failure, but actually as a sign of success.